Welcome to Wood Talk, crafting artisanal sawdust since 2007. Now here are your hosts, Mark, Shannon, and Matt. Well, well, well. It's episode 544. It's good to see everybody. On today's well, show, well, we're talking well. about <laughs> what does credibility look like in 2023? Pore filling, getting shop time when you've got kids, and finishing only one side of a board. But before we get to that, we want to let you know that Wood Talk is brought to you by Rockler. Rockler has been helping customers create with confidence for over 65 years. Rockler's giving away a $250 gift card to one lucky Wood Talk listener. Enter for your chance to win before January 31st at rockler.com slash woodtalk. And if you want to help support the show, you absolutely can do so by going to patreon.com slash woodtalk and signing up to become a patron of the show. We'd like to thank Scott Miller, Christian... Horsager, Horsager, Horsager. I'm gonna go with that. Chris Jacobson and Jacob Grenet. <laughs> <laughs> you like that? That's pretty good, huh? Okay, for anyone who isn't Jacob, the name is Green, but that's it's got fine. a little in the end there, you know? You make it a little more fun. You're welcome. Enjoy Classic. your name upgrade. Classic Cremona. <laughs> <laughs> no, my favorite my favorite part of the show <laughs> the my favorite part is i can see your face and your expression when i said that, that was... <laughs> the funny thing the is back I, of my I... mind i'm thinking oh these are easy names today that's no fun no <laughs> yep he'll make it fun there are times where i talk to other people who podcast and i think a lot of folks do video like as a routine thing it's just part of what they do that's how they see each other and they gauge each other's reactions and they can't believe that we don't see each other like our timing is pretty good and and how we flow through the show um if you're listening to this show you may not know that we do not see each other uh and for the first time in years we decided to start to capture the video just to see if it's worth uploading it's probably not because it's just our faces but we might do something with the video but now we can see each other and i gotta tell you guys it's throwing me off actually it's different I, I don't want to see you guys. <laughs> Where this. is that? No, what, I, what I've been doing is I cover you with another window. So I don't have to see you. I put so the notes I don't know. on you guys most of the time. Dude, dude, I was going to say, the show notes are kind of always up when we, yeah. when we do this. So I've right, had to so like we don't pull it off have to, to the actually, side. Yeah, the, seeing your lips move does not do me any favors. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> not during the show. I mean, maybe other times it might. In, you know, in the evening. Oh, no. After a nice Sugar dinner. lips. <laughs> Oh, hey, totally off topic, and it's a dining oh, table oh, episode anyway. So, Matt, do you remember, I'm going to take you back to Atlanta, Workbench Con, Pirate's Boil. Yes? Yeah, it was good. Hanford, it again. right? Guess what I found here in Missouri. They, they got place, one of those there? A boil place, I swear, dude, from the interior that looks like the inside of a pirate ship to, like, <laughs> everything you could ask for, we found this place that's uh, just 10 minutes from work. I've been there twice in the last week, and my yeah, so, uh, I've been um, on the toilet as a result. But are we? Is this an invitation for me to come and have dinner sometime? Yes, you got to come out here. It, it was, <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. Oh my gosh. Anyway, so I'll tell you what. For all the things I don't like about Missouri, oddly enough, the one complaint I do not have is the food. The food here on on all the things that I really really like has been fantastic. So there's my there review of Missouri. Fun, like, is there a Cajun place? Because that was our place in. <laughs> denver still looking for like a straight up cajun um you know like that was a good, good too boy. yeah that was pretty good in denver that was actually one of my favorite things in denver um, but i like the food here better just overall so there's that i'm gonna leave a yelp review for missouri if that's possible for missouri <laughs> just as a whole <laughs> <laughs> the, the people and the countryside not so much but the food thumbs up <laughs> no just kidding uh... people here are fine more than just a rest stop on the way to Kansas. Right. You don't just have to pass through. There's actually some stuff you could do there. Okay. Well, dining table episode. It means we grab a topic and we try to hash it out best we can. A lot of times it's not specifically woodworking related. And uh, that's uh, no exception here today. So we actually have two options. Two great questions from uh, Gary and Thomas. We're going with Gary's question. And I think next time we'll do Thomas's question. So let me read this here. He says, first off, the three of you create a wonderful show infusing lighthearted humor with insightful tips and tricks from your vast experience. Now to the heart of my comment, a couple of topics have come up in the more recent episodes, content creation and influencers, AKA tool shells. The average rowdy redneck DIY hobbyist does not understand and quite frankly, doesn't care to understand that content creation is an art as well as an end to, end to the meme. It is business, it is income. You guys know you guys know that and live it. 
on the topic of influencers, especially regarding tools, it all comes down to one word, credibility. There's been a new wave of these influencers who have crossed the line into full-time content creation, but have zero credibility with regard to actual woodworking. Kind of like the blind leading the blind. They do develop a loyal yet highly segmented audience, kind of like a fraternal organization, but 99.9% of the content, in quotes, they produce is directly stolen from credible sources, i.e. Mark made a comment on the show as well as on YouTube about using tongue oil cut with citrus solvent, D-limonene, I believe, as a much better alternative than mineral oil. Literally less than a week after that was published, some influencer grabbed it and made it his own. I get it. This happens all the time, but if there was one thing that drives me nuts, it's narcissism. Fortunately, you guys are the real deal, have earned your spot through time. I could ramble forever about social media, content marketing, etc., but we'll reserve my comments for a later time. Just a Oh, by the way, he did say he was medicated when he wrote this email. I want to add that in there. <clears throat> just a teaser. He says, "Just a teaser. This is interesting and this is a little ominous here." Um, there will be an upheaval coming sooner than later in the social media space that will be driven directly by advertisers and the further restrictions on, you're shaking your head, Shannon. What is this, P2? It's all privacy uh, restrictions. I mean, GDPR. Uh, yeah, I know what that, that is, but what's the P2? Years now? It's, it's, a, it's a, just a follow-on to okay. GDPR, which is kind of making it even more regulated, more stringent. Mm-hmm. And more than anything. So yeah, it's, it's all, you know, it's, it's like Google saying that they're not going to allow cookies. Um, yeah. And so uh, pixel tracking and things like that. There's no doubt that in order to advertise the way it's done now, there's a serious privacy violation. There's no way to be on the internet. You know, I don't care how thick your tinfoil hat is. Your, people are following you. Your phone is listening to you. So this is further stricter regulation that's going to prevent basically all of it. Dude, the yeah, number of the times... The pendulum is swinging the other way. <laughs> well, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. Um, the, there, the number of times that I've had a conversation with someone and not a Google search, haven't been searching anything, and it could just be coincidence, but the number of times I've had a conversation about an unrelated thing that I normally would not be talking about shows up as an ad for a, a comparable product in my mm-hmm. Facebook feed. Is yeah. like It's happened at least a dozen times. And every time I'm just like, wait a minute, did I search for it? Did I do like something that I, I don't, I'm not remembering? But I, it's too much to be coincidental. But also, I, I, I like to think that when my phone says it's not recording me, that it is not <laughs> recording me. I'm not a tinfoil hat person, but there's some interesting coincidences that happen. Well, just the fact that like my GoPro camera has that like pre-record function. Yeah. yeah. Like, so you it's don't recording. miss the kid's goal. It's yeah. actually yeah. recording right yeah. now. It's it obviously just, is. You know, it's just dumping the footage after whatever, 30 seconds or whatever. It's kind of kind yeah. of crazy. Um, I'm going to turn my GoPro camera away from me right now. Just in case. <laughs> just put it in your pocket or something. Um, so I think the, the thing I wanted to break down here is an interesting topic about credibility. Because I, let's take back you know a little bit of a history lesson here. When when I first started as, as one of the first people doing this kind of thing online, you know, I, I, I'd like to think that I was pretty honest about the fact that some of the stuff I was learning for the first time or learning it very recently. But the difference for me was this library of content didn't exist yet online. So I was going back to classic sources. I was going back to books. I was going back to DVDs. And even if it was something I just recently learned, I learned it from a very, you know, heavily vetted resource. Course, um, and a lot of times find woodworking or something like that. But no one had put this information into this format in this location. So it was like, well, if no one else is going to do it, I'll do it. So it's a little bit of a different situation where now you may have someone who just learned something for the first time and maybe competitively is trying to make their version of it uh, so that they get the views that they're looking for. And you also have a situation where many people stopped researching past 2006. So everything they know is built upon information someone learned from someone else on YouTube who learned that from someone else on YouTube. That's a great way for that that little party trick you do where you you have a sentence that you say and you whisper it into someone's ear and they whisper it into the next person's ear and it goes around the room. And by the time it comes back, it's not the same sentence. Um, And I think that's (laughs) to a degree what could be happening Uh, certainly on YouTube, that's very different now. But I just kind of want to put that out there that this was this was the secret to my success, if if I'm being completely honest, was I wasn't incredibly experienced as a woodworker. I was just getting started 
as a woodworking instructor. I started to teach classes just because I had a little bit of a knack for teaching. And my woodworking was growing as I was learning, but it was just simply, there was nothing else at the time. So it le- gave me that opportunity to do it at the time, or, or I guess was kind of my permission to myself to be able to teach this because there was no other alternative. So I may as well step up and do it. So I don't know what, I mean, you guys have thoughts or gut reactions to this whole credibility thing and how you convey what may be new information that you received, but you're now conveying it to an audience, like responsibility that comes with that. I mean, I just have to laugh (laughs) because like you said, this is the same thing. Listeners, people like Adria who've listened to the whole catalog will remember the fine woodworking vetting debacle. I was hoping someone um, would bring that up. And, and Ace's <laughs> apology tour when he came on our show. I love yeah. that title, Ace's apology tour. Um, oh, yeah, back, that's right. It, gosh, I mean, this was like 2012 or, or 11 or something. Yeah. But it was the same boat where I don't, I can't remember that. I, I doubt knowing the guys at fine woodworking, I doubt they called anybody out by name. But it was this whole idea that they find woodworking as the vetted establishment, the guys with lots of experience were were saying that all these people online have no experience and are basically one day more experienced than the people they're teaching. And that's, you know, compounding errors, I think, is what they actually titled the episode. And I remember at the time, you know, we took exception to it. I mean, in our lighthearted poking fun kind of way. Um, but it, 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 I can remember people actually blogged back then the bloggers went nuts like they yeah, this were was 2012 furious. by the way 2012 yeah yeah i thought it was somewhere around then it was early on in this show's life but people got really upset that you know how dare you put yourself on a pedestal and you you know yes you're 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 therefore vetting everybody you put in the magazine so it goes two ways right i mean kind of like our social media discussion on our previous episode where it it it's good and it's bad. You know, I, I do think that if you let's, let's face it, I think content creation, good content creation is a lot about presentation and your ability to be comfortable in front of a camera and to, to teach or, or entertain or whatever your personal idiom is. Um, and then there's others that are just terrible at it, you know? And I think Mark, I, I think you and I can certainly relate to this. The people that like were doing media at the time, some of them were terrible. Like, yeah. <laughs> and, and there was just like, they were making things either way too complex or they just weren't explaining it in a proper way. Or they mm-hmm. had so many years of teaching in classroom settings. And then they were told to stand in front of a camera. Yeah. I mean, some of those Lee Nielsen videos that are still for sale, some of those are really bad. Yes. You know, great content <laughs> because it's taught by Chris Bexford or Larry Williams or something like that. But it's like, oh my God, yeah, shoot it's, it's forgivable because it's a master of their craft, but not necessarily and, and that's, a master that's of point. presentation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I think what happened, and certainly I blame Mark for this in a good way, you know, Mark stopped taking it so seriously. He was poking yeah. fun at himself and and joking around. And, and, you know, it wasn't such a big deal. And you could teach about how to use a joiner while cracking jokes or wearing a blonde wig or something like that. You know, that was, well, that was <laughs> well, maybe not anymore. Shannon. Maybe, okay. Fair <laughs> enough. How times have changed. Um, that and the long hair around the joiner is a bad idea from a safety yeah, that's, perspective. I'm just talking about the safety. That's all. Yeah, sure. But <laughs> this was now, this was an opportunity for, for those of us that maybe, maybe we had one day more experience yeah. than you. I, I've done this four times. And now I'm teaching it, but I was, I wasn't, I, at least the way I looked at it, I wasn't teaching it. I was just conveying the steps and I was hopefully capturing it with different camera angles and showing how it was done. And I think the real drive when we started, Mark was slowing it down and showing truly here's how this project is built. Mm -hmm. And there's no like cut to commercial and come back and, you know, here we are, you know, seven days later, that type of thing. That was the, the big change for us. So now to come full circle and to have, you know, I mean, the, the, the content format has changed so many times from long form to short form to shorts, literally to, you know, reels to back to long form to all kinds of now, now it's not education. Now it's entertainment. What are you trying to do? Um, I, I think as long as you're not doing, showing something that's going to hurt somebody um, and frankly, you're doing a decent job of it. You know, whether that's yeah. really educational, like I got, I got a lot out of this 
or I was entertained. Who cares? You know, um, no. I'm not going to, I'm not, certainly not going to say that guy shouldn't be talking about this because I have more experience because now I'm in that position, you know, 15 years down the road. Now I, I can say, well, heck, I've got, you know, I've got quite a bit of experience in woodworking. Yeah. So Suddenly you're on the other side of that. Right. But I, I, I hope to think that I'm not bothered by that. Like um, there's a lot of people out there who are certainly getting a lot more views than I am, you know, who are, are topping or touching on a topic that I did eight years ago or one year ago or one week ago. Um, mm-hmm. doesn't matter as long as they kind of do it in their own way, which is what I think is the good thing about the internet is that whole tribe idea. You know, you yeah. find the people you relate to and you become a fanboy or whatever of that particular person. Um, and you're always saying, Hey, why don't you do a video? I get emails all the time. Why don't I wish you would do a video on this? And I'm thinking, God, like 17 people did that last week, but they were worse. They yet, you hear... already, you already did it. And it's, Oh yeah. Years old. Generally <laughs> two and three times actually yeah. I've already done it. Um, yeah. but, but you know, then I, I usually respond that way and they say, yeah, but I want to see you do it. And then yep. I'm like, okay, you need a life, but okay, sure. Well, <laughs> well you're so you nice. got to raise your standards, boy. <laughs> But the trick is these days, I think popularity can be confused with credibility. Just thinking in terms of my kids and I'll watch what they watch and the way that people come across, especially on YouTube in particular, uh, my kids will walk away thinking that that's the truth. You know what? Something they watched, uh, they were told a story and they believe that is the version of the story. Um, and then I have to kind of like, if I know what it's, I don't have a specific for instance here, but I, you know, we'll make sure they understand that, well, it's not exactly how it goes or, you know, try to make them understand that. But because a person is entertaining and has a, you know, personality that people can identify with that buys them some credibility because they look trustworthy or they, they have made me laugh. Honestly, you made me laugh. So now I, I, I believe you, what you say. Now this can go into like a deeper topic with tool reviews where you're really trusting someone because it's not just that you're learning something from them. Now you might spend money on a thing that they recommended. And I think we confuse that all the time now with someone just being entertaining and interesting and that buying some level psychologically of credibility that makes it, you know, I could believe what this person says. And in some cases it may, maybe that credibility is unearned. Uh, maybe it's not. I, I'm not here to, to judge anyone in particular, but that is an interesting thing to watch. And it's also something that I clearly benefit from. I've talked enough and have made enough content and hopefully have not steered people wrong that I built that credibility. But a lot of it really just comes from like, maybe they like me, maybe I was interesting enough and I've been around long enough. Does that necessarily mean that I'm the, the, the most credible person out there from a woodworking perspective? Heck no, there's people who are woodworking circles around me, but I guess I'm a known quantity at this point. Um, but it's hard to knock these people who are new, right? Because that, you know, we were there too at a point. We were, but yeah. And I think ultimately, you know, that over time it weeds out the people that truly are doing, you know, bad stuff. I don't know how, to, how else to characterize <laughs> that, you know, truly well, are just catch up with them. playing the game, you know, and Hey, this got a lot of views. So I'm going to do the same topic. I think over time, um, you're either adding value. And if what you're doing is entertaining, and I think woodworking is where we can kind of get a little bit more granular on this, because ultimately we are trying to teach somebody how to do something. So if somebody then goes into their shop and they totally fail at it, or they don't understand what to do, or they can't use your instructions, then they go, well, all right, you know, I'm not really sure. So having an open mind, maybe they go back to that person and say, Hey, I tried to do this, but it didn't work out. And if that person never responds in the comments or is completely inaccessible, or they don't help them get any further, then maybe that person kind of goes down a notch and they go looking for that same topic from someone else. And then they, they talk to them and maybe they have success talking to this other person or watching this other person do it. So eventually kind of, I hate to use the expression, but the cream rises to the top and, or more importantly, people just lose interest. Um, on both yeah. sides, watching and creating and people start to, to fall away. Um, See, I say, I say maybe to that because there <laughs> is, there is so many, there are so many people who are watching who are actually not that interested to go out and test this advice. They're mm, watching yeah. because this is entertaining. It's interesting and they have no reason to test it. So that's the lion's share of the viewership. It's a very small percentage that's actually saying, Hey, this ding dong recommended this tool. I bought that tool. It doesn't work as they perform. Now I, this person lost trust points with me. Um, that's a very small number of people. I think the vast yeah. majority 
are just there to watch it and they move on with their life and they go, ah, that's a great video. And they actually do trust this person. They'll even regurgitate the crap that person says because they, they do have that trust built, but, but it may never come out because the person who's regurgitating it is not actually doing, they're just watching, you know, and they think that they, I mean, look at my, my TikTok feed is a great example of people who are just regurgitating crap that some other person said that they know nothing about, but they think they do because they just watched a video about it. Do you know Did what I mean? You know so you can use water to accelerate CA glue. You know, we should probably talk about that. You guys want to talk? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's another good one. Somebody sent me this on Instagram. Fantastic video. It's this lady who's like one of those, uh, she doesn't want any harsh chemicals in her kitchen type, all natural crunchy people. And she has wooden spoons and utensils. And she's showing people how, if you take your old kitchen utensils and you boil them and you're going to disinfect them by doing this. So she puts them in boiling water. She goes, here's what it looks like after five minutes. Here's what it looks like after 10 minutes. And here it is after 20 minutes and the water's discolored. And she's like, and that's just all of the, the food oils and the bacteria. Oh, gross. And I'm just like, Oh Jesus, you're a moron. You're such an idiot. And, and, and the problem is and the lignin and <laughs> like, you, like, I just want like, you could put raw wood in a boiling pot of water and it's going to color the water. Get all the that's juices, all the wood juices out of there. Like everything that's not clear is bacteria. Like, right. so the, the oh, whole wow. premise that's racist, man, that's racist. <laughs> the whole premise is completely flawed, but it wasn't even so much the woman's video that was problematic for me. It was the comment section. The comment oh, section Lord. going, uh, husbands tagging wives, wives tagging husbands. Hey, we need to do this. We should do this. Shouldn't we do this? Oh, we should do this. Look, oh my God, I never knew. It's like wood soup. <laughs> like, it's like a, but it's, they're making stock. It's bad information. <laughs> it's bad advice, but it is from a source that is uh, appearing to be credible. And that's super problematic. <laughs> I don't know what you do about that. I just hope people like... Our kids, let's say, you know, Matt, hopefully we're, we're, we're teaching our kids over time to have a certain level of apprehension and filtering that has to go on. And I think even older woodworkers who are doing this, you search for a topic. I hope you don't just find the first video that comes up and go, that's the way to do it. Okay. I got my info. You got to look around a little bit and maybe go to the videos that aren't as polished. And, and sometimes you'll find that that's actually like Shannon was saying, the people who don't necessarily have the best presentation skills right. actually have the best information, you know, so you may uh, need to dig deeper. I find it appropriate that you brought me up as you talk about people that aren't polished with <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> the man. old videos, the old videos. You're yeah, the best. <laughs> you do a traveling show in the, in the summertime at the, you know, the woodworking clubs and stuff. Yeah. I've got some really good 320p videos out there. <laughs> yeah. So Matt, you've been quiet. Um, what are your thoughts here? Unfortunately, I think it kind of goes back to the person that's actually making these videos to self-regulate in a sense. I mean, obviously I can really only speak from my own experience, but when I, like when I started, it wasn't like, I know all this stuff with my mentality, with my presentation was like, I, I know all this stuff. I know the right way of doing this. And what I say is like gospel. It's not, I, I didn't try and like pose my presentation in that way i definitely try to pose it as like this is my life experience this is kind of where i'm at here's the things that i don't know like if i don't know something i'm pretty upfront with it in the videos like i don't really do this it was, this is literally my first time doing this let's see how yeah. this goes or if you make a mistake it shows up absolutely i'll show that so it's it really goes back to the presenter more than anything oh. and I, but kind of going back to the original topic yes i mean like a lot of the topics i did early on and still now it's been like, okay, there's like 800 videos about this, but people want to hear me do it or see my presentation of how this is done because uh, yeah. they relate better to my way of explaining things than someone else. So right. yes, I'm regurgitating things that I've seen, but I'm trying to put my own special production spin on it to make it more me, I, I guess. Yeah. Well, I also yeah, think that sense. there's a bit of fallacy in the idea that you have to have done something a hundred times in order to be able to talk about it. Sure. Like how many bandsaw mills have you built, Matt? Two. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's a, that's it. That's about two more than just about everybody else out there. <laughs> Certainly one more than the experts in the market. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not a matter of like how many mortars and tenons have I cut? I've cut a lot, but you know, th there's a thousand and one ways to do it. So it's, it's, I, or, or, or building, I, I built one sideboard 
you know, so am I an expert? Can I do a video on building a sideboard? I think so, because mm -hmm. it's still mortise and tendon joinery and panel joints and maybe a dovetail here and there. And mm -hmm. it's still woodworking. You know, the, the, the project itself, you don't have to have made a whole bunch of them, you know, a whole bunch of times. Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I, I remember back when I first started this stuff, I would um, hold the opinion that a new person who just learned a thing and the, like that light bulb went off and you got it, like you, you understand it, you can now execute it because you understand it completely. A person in that mental state might actually be at the best point to explain something. Um, and that was kind of like a logic that I used with my early videos was I just like recently in the last year or two learned these things. I'm in a good position to tell you um, how my brain saw this when I first confronted right. this information. And I think you lose that over time. And that actually has played out and held true. I will watch someone make a beginner focused presentation and just nail it. Like everything you could possibly imagine. I'm looking at it going now where I am in, in my career now going, I'd have a real hard time breaking that down to that level at this point, because I've lost that. Yeah, um, you're still because so I, far from the beginning now. Like, yeah, I, I take the it for freshness granted. of the concepts. Yeah, so there's definitely value, but I think you, you, Shannon, you're absolutely right. Or uh, it was Matt who said this. You, you're being honest about your position in all of this, and what Shannon had said before about blogging. Right, blogging was like journaling, and journaling, you know, is obviously just like here's what happened, here's how it happened, here's why it happened. Journaling and the blogging sort of grew into this production of video content, and that same uh, mentality came with us. We were saying, no, I'm not saying that this is the end all be all. You want that, go to find woodworking. What I'm telling you is this is my personal adventure and you can come with me on that journey. And that's kind of how we approach those early videos. But now everything's gotten so much better quality, um, you know, the content quality and the people who just have really interesting, compelling personalities are out there talking about this stuff. They could probably talk about any topic and BS their way through it. And we'd believe them because they're good at what they do. <laughs> It's just, uh, it's changed so much over that time. I've built my career on that ability. <laughs> <laughs> I've always said that about you. Yeah, absolutely. I can listen to Shannon talk about anything. No, I, I, think, I, I do. I think Matt, month. I think I Matt nailed yes. it. The self-regulation side of things. I mean, we, we talk about imposter syndrome and I mm -hmm. know a lot of us have felt that from time to time. And I remember early on when there wasn't a lot of white noise, you know, if you put out a video, like the whole community watched it because there was yeah. only 300 of us. <laughs> it weren't that many of you. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and if you got, if you got something wrong, you know, so rather, re let me rephrase that rather than, than kind of coming, Hey, look, I know, what, I, I know everything. I'm the expert on this. You would be very clear and say, look, I haven't done this a bunch, but here's what I've learned. Like Mark was saying, you know, mm -hmm. just now, you know, and, and I'm excited about it. And, and right. that enthusiasm was compelling and that, you know, drove people to either try it or to watch something else. Yeah. I think yeah. what's cool about phrasing it that way is you kind of open the audience to making it more of a two way street versus just like one directional feed of, of yeah. information. So you get mm -hmm. actually yeah. get a lot of great feedback from the people that may have more experience than you have maybe tried different ways of doing things. And you're like, Oh, that makes a lot more sense. So you actually get to tap into like the knowledge and information in the audience as well as being able to you know, just put your own ideas out there. But then in the yeah. future, you can also relate back to, oh, I have all these comments come in as we talk about this topic again. Let me present some more different views or different ideas that I didn't previously know because I only had uh, what I had seen. Yeah, mm -hmm. it cuts back on negativity, I think, as well. If you're, you know, for the people who know a little bit more about it than you do and who d maybe don't know how to conduct themselves online. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, just want to give you crap about it. It's like, well, look, I never said I was, you know, giving you the end all be all resource here. I was telling you, I'm, I'm trying to figure this out as I go. Um, people tend to approach it like, oh, okay, well maybe try this next time. You know, like it just changes the personality and the, the mood a little bit. Agreed. Well, and here's some advice. If you're going to copy someone on like a finishing technique, at least do what Matt did and wait a few years, you know, <laughs> before you do yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> Because, you know, just out of respect. I mean, it's not too much to ask, is it? Uh, yeah, it may well, here's not. the funny thing. Here's the funny it's thing. The about respect that. part that's missing from that equation. <laughs> yeah. That respect. Uh, actually, that was back when I did respect you. Never mind. Yeah, <laughs> not anymore. I lost yeah, that years ago. Gone. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if, if this tongue oil um, citrus solvent thing was that done that way, well, you never know, right? People can come up with unique ideas or semi-unique ideas at the same time. That does happen. Uh, but if it truly did happen, then that guy's just a, a turd burger. Um, but 
let's keep in mind that I didn't invent that. Um, that was something that what? came from, what? <laughs> I know it's surprising. I also going to, here's, here's another, here's another one. I didn't invent the cutting board. So I don't believe I'm that. Disappoint some I don't people. believe that for one minute. Really going to disappoint some people. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. you should so, boil those too with yes. your with your wooden yeah. spoons definitely mm-hmm. should oh, you, and the lady also goes well just as an example to show you how well this works here's a spoon that i put in the dishwasher and look there's still staining on it I'm like oh god oh it hurts no <laughs> i hate you so much <laughs> <It's> terrible uh, <laughs> i want to like i want to like go to her kitchen with like a steam bending form and mm-hmm. just yes. take all of her spoons and bend them into weird shapes can you bend her lips shut how about that? <laughs> That'd be good. Um, Cue the well, pen nailer. Being real angry today. Uh, well, you know what? Uh, you know who's got a lot of credibility? <laughs> mm. <laughs> Going to go right to that, huh? As a, as a blue verified sticker, check mark, whatever. <laughs> they got a lot of credibility with me, as far as I'm concerned. That's, uh, that's Rockler. Our friends over at Rockler create the perfect cabinet, work table, or shop cart system for your workshop. You guys have ever played with this? The Rocksteady kits that they have on the site? Pretty good stuff. I like these. These are pretty slick. Yes, I have one that needs to be assembled. There you go. Yeah, it's fantastic stuff. The Rocksteady shop stand kits from Rockler feature strong, heavy duty gauge steel construction and pre-drilled holes for easy assembly and accessorizing. These are the best workshop stands in the business. Mix and match shop stand dimensions to suit your needs. Choose from one of Rockler's complete kits or select individual shop stand components and accessories. Rockler's Rocksteady Shop Stand Configurator. Oh, that thing's so fun. You gotta go play with it. It makes it easy to design and shop for the perfect custom workshop stand. And we'll put a link there in the show notes. At least just go have fun with the configurator because sometimes, yeah, I mean, some of this stuff you could just build it, but with the price of plywood and stuff yeah. these days, you gotta be thinking about other options. And um, this uh, configurator is a fun tool to play with. So go check it out over at rockler.com. I'll just give you the link here real quick. It's shop-stand-configurator. And Boom, that uh, free shipping code, it works on that. There you go. <laughs> oh, that sweet. could be some expensive shipping by the time yeah, you configure you'll want that. your shop. And again, they're not kidding when they say like how heavy duty um, the materials are. They are heavy duty. It's a real good quality stuff. I've got uh, the roll around. I think it's under the Rocksteady um, you know, name, uh, but it's the roll oh, around clamp stand. Thing? Oh, mm-hmm. the, kind of that the, one. the clamp, clamp cart. Well, and I also have the plywood cart thing. I think that's all under that same it's, umbrella. I know what you have. You even know what you have. <laughs> I don't know. I know what I have. I've been trying to figure it out for years. <laughs> all right. So we do have a couple it's of questions. Uh-huh. Uh, a couple of questions to get through here. Um, what's this first one from um, Jonathan? Why did I put Matt's name on that? I don't know. I was wondering. I'm, just, that, I'm clicking a button. You're not, you're not reading anything. <laughs> okay, here we go. Hey, Mark, Shannon, and Matt. Jonathan from New Brighton, Minnesota calling in, and I wanted to ask about pore filling, specifically kind of what works well, what doesn't work well, kind of what you've used in your experiences with that. Shannon, you mentioned using z many episodes ago, and I never heard an update on that about do you like it, do you not, kind of what are your experiences. I know some people use 4F pumice, some people do a wet sand with BLO. And yeah, I'm working a lot with ash and oak and just wanted to see kind of how that would affect my projects and and how that would make things look to have a a smoother, less kind of bumply, pore-filled surface. So thanks much. Keep up the good work. And thanks for not quitting or knitting. All right. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, Shannon, you got some feedback on that? Yeah, I have a box of Z-poxy. Z-poxy. I I quite enjoyed it. It, it kind of depends upon the wood that you're pore filling. You know, if it's got big, wide open pores, uh, the epoxy fillers fill really fast. Um, it was a one application, one coat thing. Um, I was working with chestnut and tamo ash, so very wide open pores. You, you use the, um, it's got like the little squeegee things that come with it. So you basically just dump it on and squeegee it around the surface across the grain and work it into the pores. Um, that was one application, uh, came back the next day and, um, sanded it back. You know, it kind of gives you that, um, as you sand it, you get that kind of white, um, scuffed surface. Once that goes away, you're good to go. Um, so I've done pore filling, like in the pumice side of things, like pumice rotten stone thing that takes for flipping ever. It's a lot um, of work. And, and you have to lock it in. Um, because there's no binder, you know, so then you're putting like shellac in there to lock that pumice in place, or you're just going to start pulling it out of the pores. And you have to be really careful when you're applying the shellac, because you could, you know, if you brush it too much, you'll 
you'll pour the pumice right out of the pores. So that would be good for something like mahogany that's got really, really small pores. Actually, I don't think pumice and rotten stone is good for anything. It's, it's, <laughs> The it's way good for a dead chapter it. in an old finishing book is what it's good for. Basically, yeah. Yeah, it worked great for Goddard and Townsend, and that was 300 years ago. 300? Yeah. I don't know what year it is. Yeah, 300 <laughs> years ago. Um, <laughs> what year is it? I tried. Um, I also tried Solares, which was a pore filler UV cure. That was similar to the epoxy. It wasn't as thick. So I think if I were doing something like oak, I would probably need to do multiple applications. But who cares? Because, mm -hmm. like, there's no dry time. It's squeegee it on and just with the uv thing and put on another coat nice. um that was given to me by uh, a luthier customer um uh professional guitar maker over on the eastern shore and that's what they use constantly for like six and seven pour fillings on like the backs of guitars and things like that that was super cool it was also just fun you know to get the little i had a little uv light you know plugged in and got myself a tan in between it was awesome <laughs> yeah so it was, it's good for you but yeah, that's it from one extreme to the other from UV cured epoxy to pumice and rotten stone. That's been my pore filling experience. I've used a uh, timber mate a lot. That's the, um, it's just the wood filler, but you can dilute it down mm -hmm. to use it as a pore filler. And I've done that in a couple of videos. That's good to use. If I want the pores to not only be filled, but kind of disappear. Uh, you use a clear pore filler, you still see those pores. If you use a colored pore filler, it kind of just uh, tones down the background. You don't see the pores as much. And it just, uh, depending on the species, you may or may not want that. And so that's something to keep in mind. But Timbermate works great. I've done the uh, slurry, or like the wet sanding method. Ah, yes. Which, I don't know. It's definitely work. I think that, I, honestly, the hardest part about that is you need like the fine sawdust from your sander. And as soon as you like make the switch to a dust extractor, like you don't have the little bag on the back of your sander to like dump on the surface. Right. So getting the, getting the sawdust is kind of the hard part with that, but it's not that bad once if you have enough sawdust to make yeah. it work. Because like you're not the, really the, trying the, to sand the surface to make sawdust. You're supposed to yeah. bring sawdust into it. And then it's more like just kind of smearing it around. It's mm. really such a dumb problem for a woodworker to have, right? <laughs> like, I don't have any sawdust. <laughs> Because <laughs> it's all collected. You know, it's all in this big giant bag mixed with everything else I sucked up. Yeah, so then you just grab yeah. a board and you're just yes. sanding it down yes. to get yep. the dust. Look, yeah. I'm only saying this because I've been there. <laughs> I, I would have to do that. I don't actually have anything that creates that fine of dust in my shop anymore. Right. Yeah, Shannon's even worse. I'm going to sand this board. I really to make don't dust. have sawdust. You just I need a blender. Shavings. You keep the shavings, put the shavings in the blender. There we go. Should yeah. work. Or you can boil vodka, them. You're good to go. And then strain yeah. them and press them. You know? Yeah. Then Boil them. them. Get that bacteria out of there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Shannon, you got the. Uh, All right, let's move nice on one. with John's question. Uh, <laughs> this is, uh, let's see. He says, John with the Southern Draw here again. He doesn't want me to read this with the Southern Draw, does he? That, <laughs> no, go for it. That would not go well. <laughs> I'd, I'd end up sounding like Foghorn Leghorn, and that would be many other issues that would you're come sorry, out You're going to sound like. You uh, haven't Charles offended Brock. anyone in a while, Shannon, so let's go for it. <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> Uh, let's see. I was busy, busy walking my newborn with a leash. <laughs> there it, ding. There it is. <laughs> Shannon's offense of the quarter. <laughs> this leash demeans us both. Uh, so I'm a stay at home dad. I also share custody of my six year old. I love my family, but how in the world do I make time to create things I want to make as well as products to sell? My garage is so close, but it feels worlds away. My baby goes to sleep at seven and the garage is too close to his bedroom. Thoughts? Wow. This is an open-ended question. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I can tell you, I think people have this problem even if they're not worried about waking up the kids. You know, pe life is busy, getting time in the shop. I think what I have had success with and what I've actually had a lot of success in talking to my students about is kind of getting organized and planning your shop time, even going so far as scheduling your shop time. You know, I'm going to be working in the shop from this time to this time and don't overlook the 10 minute shop session. You can get a lot done in the shop in 10 minutes if you know what it is you're going to do. And you stay you know, off if you just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's that. If you just walk into the shop and say, I'm going to work on this project, but you don't know what you're going to do for that project, you can waste 10 mm -hmm. minutes like that, for just sure. kind of walking around the shop and putting on the shop apron and, you know, just messing around with stuff. But if you know, I've got a 15 minute session tomorrow and I need to cut the mortise and tenons for that face frame. So I'm going to cut two mortars and tenons. 
you go into the shop, you can get two mortise and tenons cut. I don't know, care, care what your method is in, in 10 minutes. And say you get it done faster than that. If you have a list, literally a checklist of the different steps, you actually can get a heck of a lot done. And it allows you, especially in this situation with John, where you know he's a stay-at-home dad, there's probably quite a bit of time when maybe he could get away for five minutes, but he's got to be immediately available to run back in the house, mm -hmm. you know, when somebody cries or doorbell rings or something, you know, the baby monitor goes off. So being hyper, hyper focused and organized. And I will often tell people to kind of take that project and break it down to steps that you can measure by time. And if you look at that step and go, I don't know how long that's going to take, break it down further. You know, if the, if the step is dovetail a drawer and you're like, I don't know, that could take me an hour. So this sounds kind of silly, but actually writing it down saying, cut the half blinds on the front corner. Okay. I have a better idea of how long that's going to take. Plus there's that like Everybody's got that like deep seated satisfaction that comes from checking a box on a checklist. Oh, yeah. Actually Lists having a physical checklist and and being able to, okay, I got five minutes of shop time and being able to check two boxes when you walk out of the shop, you feel fulfilled and you mm -hmm. you you feel excited to go into the shop again because you know the next time you go in, you're gonna do those next two check boxes. So this has absolutely nothing to do with whether or not you're gonna wake the baby or not. This is just about being super efficient with your time and being really organized with what it is you're actually going to do in, in the shop. Yeah. Then you can tackle the question of how do I keep from waking the baby? You know, um, can I do, does this particular exercise make a lot of noise? And more importantly, if I'm making a lot of noise and it's not waking the child, can I hear the child if the child has problems? Like if the child starts screaming, Am I going to be able to hear that while I've got my headphones on and the dust collector blaring? Those are the things you can say, okay, well, I can only do those tasks when, you know, he's got, he's at joint custody, when I'm not on custody duty that day or something like that. Yeah. So I, I think the bigger question is not, am I going to wake the child? It's how you organize your shop time. Focus on that first. And I think the other part of the question maybe will answer itself. Now, for somebody who doesn't have kids, let me pass over to people who have kids. <laughs> Speaking of credibility. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sounds like you just learned about this, Shannon. Uh, you want to talk more about it? He's new to this. Yeah. Um, I know for me, like I always try to encourage people to just don't be afraid to take some time away. There are certain phases in your kids' lives where it's just not going to work. It's not going to be convenient. There's no good that comes of it. I can tell you from my own experience, maybe it's a personality flaw. But if I get my site set, I got my checklist that Shannon mentioned, and I got a thing I want to get done on that checklist, and I start it, and babies are dumb. They cry for no reason. And even after you put them down two seconds later, they cry. So if I got started on something and then got interrupted, if that was my five minutes and I still couldn't get that five minutes done, it actually makes me a worse parent because I go back in the house. I got a chip on my shoulder. I'm just, I can bring the whole house down with a bad attitude that way. Um, so there are times where it's just better not to even think about it. Go into research mode, go into design mode, get it sketch up on, on a laptop, on a dining room table. You got 10, 15 minutes, design something, start, you know, read something, uh, watch a video about something like go into research mode to kind of get your arsenal of, uh, tools and information. Um, so that even the next time you're in the shop, you've got more, um, knowledge behind you. Um, I just think it's okay to take a break, especially when you've got a young one that's that little. And then later the print, you know, the opportunities will present themselves a little bit more. Like Shannon said, you'll get to a point where if there's a problem, they can come get you. Uh, you could have monitors and stuff in the shop that will let you know what's going on out there. You could check in every once in a while. I certainly have done woodworking with a baby monitor in the shop many times. Um, so nothing wrong with that, but I think right now, take it easy on yourself, man. You don't have like, if you're a stay at home dad and you don't need the income from the products you make, wouldn't really be fussing with it too much right now. I would give it some time. What about you, Matt? As, as someone who uh, has children and has gone through this. <laughs> That's why we ask you. When I, I was a stay-at-home dad, when uh, I started the business and when JR was born, and you'll never you have an are. easy... Shh, shh, silence. You still are a stay-at-home dad. I guess I still I do stay here, and I am a dad. <laughs> Do you stay here? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Come on. Lindsay lets him Call stay. Call a spade a spade. Your <laughs> wife is the one that goes out to work. And she works right behind me right there. That's her desk. No, it, it still counts more than yours does. The prop desk. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> prop desk. Uh, anyway, Sorry. Go ahead. As, as someone who has gone through this, 
I mean, if you have a newborn, now is the time to get your shop time in because as soon as that person gets actually mobile, it's it's kind of over. So the amount of time that I have spent in the shop with the baby monitor, you know, newborns they sleep all the time, like all the time, like most of them. They sleep a Some lot. Some of them, not so mine. Like, if they're sleeping, what? Except when what, you try to sleep, right? Yeah. Except, well, yes, that's different. So you just you sleep when the baby sleeps. That's the other thing. Mm-hmm. You kind of you kind of learn if you're kind of on your on your own with that. But um, yeah, the baby monitor in the shop. So I just keep an eye on it. Like if the baby's crying or screaming or moving around, like you can see that on the monitor. If you wanted to, you could plug your you know your headphones into the monitor and listen. If you wanted to do that too. Um, if they're awake though, like they don't move. So like if you're doing something that's quiet and that you can like do like you want to set up your table saw for the tenon you're going to cut tomorrow, you can do that. You're just like swapping blades. Maybe you're putting a dado stack in. You can do that kind of stuff. If at the beginning of the project, you can do all your lumber selection and layout and all of that kind of fun, quieter type of stuff. If you do some more hybrid woodworking type of stuff and you want to do some like hand cut dovetails, you can do that with the baby in the room. I did that a lot. So I don't think there's necessarily like babies here. I can't do anything. You can still do it. <laughs> I, uh, I got one of those, uh, what, which one called the things that you wear the baby. I did that too in the baby shop. Or there's, yeah. There's strap things. It yeah. does. That does restrict you to what you can do, but at least they're like, they're closer to you and you can make them happy versus like sitting them like on the, on like we had a boppy. So he just sat cute on the boppy. little shavings on their head. Yeah, here's some shavings. Just give them a toy to play with. Like, they're babies. Like, they're just like anything is a toy, anything to play with. When they got older, we had, like, this little chair. So, like, rocking chair thing that you could, like, clip them into. And Jerry would just sit there and watch me work in his little chair. So, it's like we're hanging out doing stuff. And that was honestly the easiest part. As, as soon as he got to the point where he was, like, nine months old and could roll or escape. At 11 months, he was walking. <laughs> like, was you're done target. at that point. So, then <laughs> you got to play a different strategy. Yeah. But with the newborn, I think you have a lot more flexibility of what you can do. And one of the things that we did, at least, was we kind of encouraged the idea that babies don't need quiet to sleep. Uh, so we trained them that. to sleep with noise and distractions. So when Jair was born, I was doing the flooring in our old house. And I would just I would put him in the kitchen in the next room. And I would go around on my hands and knees with my orbital sander because I'm that kind of person. And I sanded the whole floor with him there. And he slept through all the sanding. And even when people were over, we weren't like, oh, be quiet. The baby's sleeping. It was like, did you, um, did you give him baby's first respirator when you did that? I, didn't, no. I, gave, I gave him babies in a different room. <laughs> okay, just check it. Trust, 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 trust the dust extractor. There you go. <laughs> well, I mean, we, Real good point there. Baby's first isotunes. Yeah, baby's yes. first isotunes. Yes, yeah. the muffs on. Did he well, then, about the at a certain quality? age, like when he was like maybe three or four, he realized that my my muffs had the head the music or the radio on it. So he just like nice. turn it on and listen to the music. Nice. So I'm like, okay, cool. So he can wear hearing protection, so I can do mm-hmm. more things because he's content wearing hearing protection. So now I can make a little more noise. I'm not doing crazy. Yeah. But at least like I can do some hammering. Or maybe like uh, use a jigsaw or something when he's like over on the other side of the shop or something. Yeah. You bring up a real good point because thinking back to when my kids were little, um, you know who doesn't care if your babies are napping? The Air Force. And I was going to we say were, grandparents, but <laughs> them too. That, that's good too. Uh, nice. When we were in Arizona, <laughs> nice. right by Luke Air Force Base, yep. um, this Air Force Base would have flyovers constantly. And we're like, how are we going to have a kid here? They're just going to wake up every... No, they don't. They get used no. to it. So I think one of the things you may try, first of all, get them a white noise machine. Don't get the ones that like play a track. Get the ones that are actually like a fan built into just a little little box. Go to lumberupdate.com and hit play. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> that would work perfectly. Just let the archive go. Uh, but if you get a white noise machine in there, um, I think you would be surprised unless you are like banging things with a hammer and changing the noise as you go. A lot of things like the table saw, even making cuts at the table saw, a dust collector, that actually just from a distance is white noise yep. uh, to a kid. So I would, before they get used to peace and quiet, get them like Matt said, get them used to some activity and some noise around you because you might actually be able to do a lot more in there than you realize as long as the kid just gets used to it and add that white noise machine and that helps to kind of soften everything 
um, that's in the distance. So that might be something to look into. All right. Do we have another one here? There we go. Okay, yeah, one more and we'll get out of here. Uh, Eric wrote in, he says, if a finish is applied to only one side of a board, does that change the rate of absolution of moisture? <laughs> Uh, so is the finish sinful? Is that what we're saying? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll just uh, something about that was a little off. You've been absolved of moisture. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, is it more likely to cup or bow? Thanks for quitting, then unquitting, and then quitting again, and one more unquitting. Uh, so I guess I kind of put this in here just to kind of do a quick survey with us. Have you guys um, ever had any luck or bad luck? Just finishing one side of a board. Did you see a resulting problem doing that? If the board was completely free, like I board, like laying just on my just bench, a panel. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It it will it will cup um, because you're introducing moisture to one side. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if he's asking, does it change like like over time, like you know, will it move less seasonally because there's finish on one side of the board? So like, you know, if you finish the top, well, I, I think the answer is still yes. Um, the finish does offer a bit of a barrier to moisture exchange. Um, it slows it down. But yeah. But, but like that, if it's, that's if the it's heart a of the tabletop, problem. you know, if it's a tabletop that's screwed down to a base or something like that. Maybe no, not as much of an issue. I mean, probably not going to see much. No. Yeah. But ultimately, I think that's why the I'm standard to. classic practice is to finish both sides. I don't think you need to finish both sides at, to the same extent it don't gotta be pretty it don't gotta be pretty <laughs> yeah. and you don't have to put as many coats you just kind of yeah. want it sealed and you should be okay but i do think you could run into problems well not could you will uh run into problems if you make a habit of finishing boards just on one side especially if it's not mm -hmm. locked down within within a bigger project like a you know a, a panel to a frame and panel side or something so i mean the thicker the board the less an issue it's going to be yeah. um you know go to the extreme and look at veneer you know, like I, I just, I've got a video in the editor right now where I did some marquetry in it and I didn't want to put glue because I was pressing it in the bag. I didn't want to put glue on both faces of the veneer. Mm -hmm. So I had to put it on one face, oh boy. quickly oh. get it on the board, get a batten on or a platen on top of it. <laughs> that could and be in scary. like the, the, the three seconds, it, you know, I had this old potato chip and I'm trying to mm -hmm. flatten them down and get the batten <laughs> in as I flatten one down and another one's curling. Yeah. You know, that was crazy. But if it was an eight quarter board, you know, you may not see much movement. Yeah. All right. I think that's going to do it for us today. Family owned since 1954, Rockler is your go-to source for high quality and innovative woodworking tools, finishing supplies, hardware, lumber, and expert advice. Whether you're building a simple bookshelf, a custom desk, or new kitchen cabinets, Rockler has everything you need to make your next project a success. Visit rockler.com, use the code WOODTALK, it's all one word, to receive free shipping on most orders over $49. And remember to head to rockler.com slash woodtalk to enter for your chance to win a $250 gift card. Yay, money. Money. Uh, good. <laughs> Rockler money. Um, good, good topics this week. I would definitely love to hear from people about the credibility issue. I'm sure that there's a lot of people out there who, whether it's woodworking or not, are in a position where they've been forced to give an opinion or create a video or do something like that. And I've always felt like I shouldn't be doing this. Um, and there may be people out there who are like, yeah, I don't give a crap. I'm going to do it anyway because it's all about the sponsor. Giving them views, um, baby. <laughs> it's all about those free tools. So let us know uh, what your thoughts are on the whole credibility issue. And certainly if you have advice for uh, woodworking with a child in the room, we want to hear that too. So go to woodtalkshow.com, uh, fill out the little contact form there, or just send us an email. That works too. Woodtalkshow at gmail.com. You can also find us on Instagram. We are, uh, what? <laughs> What's her name? <laughs> what talk show? Yeah. I don't know. That's Margaret's job. It's oh, what talk know. something. I don't know. What talk show? That's yeah, Margaret. Um, She'll let us Of course, know. you can, yeah, just just look up Margaret. But you can also <laughs> find us and pay attention to us and 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 feed our narcissism at Matt Cremona, at Wood Whisper, <laughs> and at Renaissance Woodworker. It's all about us. Make us feel credible. Yeah, I guess so. Oh, okay. Well, thank you for listening, everybody. And we will catch you next time. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Goodbye to you. Goodbye. Goodbye.